Um, well, hello, everyone. I'm hoping that you can see my screen. Um, please confirm for me that you can. Yeah, we can see that. Go ahead in, in the presentation mode. That's even better. Thanks. All right. There we go. Uh, I'm just going to pull the chat down so that I can see if anyone wants to drop a question into the chat. Um, so there, that is now down. So I'm Steve Bowden. I'm a professor in chemical engineering here at Purdue. I'm also the director of the Purdue Energetics Research Center, or PERC. Uh, we are the foremost academic research center, I would argue, in, in uh, certainly the Western Hemisphere and possibly the world, uh, working in the area of propellants, explosives, and pyrotechnics. These are energetic materials. Um, and I'm going to talk to you for the next 45 minutes. I've got a little presentation to show you. Um, I'm hoping that you'll get excited about what I've got to say, and you'll toss questions into the chat, uh, and I can respond to those questions. We can have a little bit more of a conversation. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, the first thing that I'll do is mention that um, the work that PERC does uh, focuses quite a bit, not exclusively, but quite a bit on national security. Okay. So I've got a bunch of examples up here of some different national security applications. Um, and you can see um, the uh, F-4 is um, suppressing enemy um, aircraft defenses. So this aircraft is for uh, combating surface-to-air missiles. Um, the F-15 right here, I put this picture up, the Strike Eagle, because the, the aircraft itself is deploying um, a missile or a rocket in this particular case. Um, and down here, there's a, a sort of a collection of aircraft. There's a couple of uh, Strike Eagles. Um, there's a couple of F-16s. And there is one of the F-15C, which is this one down here. This is over uh, Desert Storm. Um, this uh, vehicle right here is a specially engineered vehicle that is mine resistant and ambush proof. Um, and then over here on the right, this is a uh, 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 missile defense system that is being deployed. Uh, and you can see the Abrams up here. And so the reason I show all of these to you is because PERC is involved with absolutely every aspect of these different um, vehicles. Okay, We are involved with the propellant that causes the missile or the rocket uh, to do what it's going to do. We are involved with making sure that the uh, missile or rocket that's attached to the aircraft airframe is capable of withstanding the performance conditions of the aircraft. Uh, that is the acceleration and the vibration and the heat. Um, we are responsible for making sure that these fly farther um, and that they deliver more energy to target uh, when they uh, arrive at a target. We are responsible for developing materials to help them fly faster uh, that by making them lighter, for example, or by improving the thrust or the power that's, that's spit out by these. Uh, in the case of uh, the vehicles here, the, uh, the MATV and the Abrams, we're responsible for engineering the materials so that if there is a blast, an improvised explosive device, uh, the blast is dissipated and it doesn't end up uh, injuring the soldiers who are inside those vehicles. Uh, we are responsible for the artillery shells that will come out of the Abrams, for example, and making sure that those can travel faster, fly um, higher, uh, travel greater distances, and deliver more energy to target. Um, the same is true of the uh, anti-missile uh, system here, the missile defense system. Um, and I'll, I'll get to here on the bottom. Since World War II, um, our arsenal has evolved by clever, insightful engineering improvements to existing materials. Okay? And since roughly 1990, so over the last 30 years, roughly, we've been engaged in what I would consider or what's generally considered non-conventional conflicts, anti-terror activities, these kinds of things. And during that time, our near peer adversaries uh, have largely caught up to us in terms of the technological superiority that we have traditionally enjoyed. Um, I was at the Air War College um, at an Air Force base in Alabama. And uh, the Air Force folks were explaining to me that what they would like is that if a, a U.S. soldier or an allied soldier, uh, one of our allies, um, hears an aircraft overhead in theater, they don't look up because they know that if we are in the sky, no one else is in the sky. Okay? We are no longer in that position in terms of having technological superiority. And in order to restore that, to, to tilt the battle space 
in favor of the United States. Um, it requires a significant investment in new materials and new methods, largely focused on energetic materials. And PERC, Purdue, has an inter interdisciplinary team, roughly 18 faculty who work to varying degrees in the space of energetic materials. This includes faculty in materials engineering, mechanical engineering, chemical engineering, um, environmental engineering, um, all of those, and, and also in chemistry and also in the Polytechnic Institute. All of those people work together uh, to develop what I consider or what I refer to as a molecules munitions framework uh, for energetic materials. Okay, and so that starts with the design, computational design in silico, calculation of what would a new energetic molecule look like? What would its composition be? What would its structure be? Okay, and then we go ahead and we synthesize those molecules. So we make new explosives, uh, characterize fully their uh, energetic behavior, and then also investigate new conformations, different type of crystal morphologies, uh, different ways of alloying them uh, in with uh, other traditional materials, uh, different types of, uh, of fuels themselves, hypergolics here, you mix two materials and they instantly um, become energetic. If you leave them separate, they're perfectly safe. Um, and so we design, new, design and synthesize new energetic materials. Then we work on formulating those materials. How do we take mixtures of energetic materials and binders and tune their mechanical properties, their material properties, their energetic properties, so that they are effective uh, munitions or effective propellants in a rocket. Um, and so that they are safe, so that if one drops on the deck of an aircraft carrier, uh, it doesn't detonate uh, in, in that location. Okay. We develop new manufacturing methods. We do additive manufacturing, inkjet printing, 3D printing of energetic materials because we need very precise configurations of energetic materials in order to have the performance that's necessary of many of uh, our munitions. Um, we also work on manufacturing uh, and we are working at developing both laboratory scale and pilot scale uh, models uh, for manufacturing energetic materials so that we can uh, use the same sorts of modern sophisticated manufacturing that are found in the pharmaceutical industry, for example, uh, to create energetic materials at scale um, quickly and responsively so that as the needs in the battle space change, we can respond and keep a well-armed uh, national defense. Uh, we do some really exciting work on characterization and engineering of post-detonation fireballs. Uh, an example of this is um, there may be a chemical weapons facility in some hostile location and it's necessary to destroy that facility. And what you don't want is to destroy that facility and spray chemical weapons all over the environment and all over all of the people who might be there. What you would prefer to do is hit that facility and have a fireball stay in place and consume completely the chemical weapons that are there so that the material that's, that's left doesn't harm all of the civilians who are around. And so that's what I would consider fireball engineering. And we do some very nice work characterizing and engineering those kinds of things. Um, we work on, whoops, I just lost my screen here, which is a little terrifying. Hold on just a second. Um, there we go. Sorry about that. Uh, we work on um, characterizing energetic materials, looking at how shock waves uh, propagate through energetic materials. I mentioned earlier high rate mechanics. Uh, and this is to make materials that are resistant to, to um, detonations, but also to study the way that energetic materials detonate themselves, what happens to cause them to form local hotspots and then off to detonation. Computationally, we work on developing digital models for energetics manufacturing, starting with farming or, or mining, excuse me, of raw materials, all the way through a finished energetic, all the way through demilitarizing materials that end up not being used in our arsenal. Uh, and then we have some applications which are more on the defensive side, detecting uh, improvised explosives devices and defeating them, uh, in this case using sound, uh, or in other cases just simply detecting trace energetic materials to, to learn if someone's made a bomb in a particular location. Okay, PERC spans eight buildings here on Purdue's campus. Um, we have right now $50 million worth of open research contracts, including a recent 25 million, roughly $25 million contract with the Army. 
that's just beginning. We have a, 120 mostly US citizen graduate students and faculty and staff working in this particular space. And we are looking to gear up with a substantial number of students in those disciplines I just mentioned. Chemistry, chemical engineering, mechanical engineering, materials engineering, and uh, the polytechnic uh, for, for our modeling and the environmental engineering people for the life cycle analysis. There's needs in all of those spaces. Here's some examples of the kind of work that we can do. In this particular case on the top, uh, you see the ways that we can measure or evaluate energetic materials. Uh, at the bottom, you see the modeling scales and in the middle are the sort of the methods that are used for the interrogation. So we can do first principles calculations of how energetic a molecule might be. And we can work all the way up to how will a molecule behave when it is, when it is squeezed together into a formulation, into a pellet, for example, as in this case. We can interrogate, starting here with lasers of individual molecules, all the way up to what's called a gas gun is a high speed impact with a composite material uh, such as this one. And then we have in-house here at Purdue ways to, to use spectroscopic methods all the way up to thermographic methods to evaluate the response of energetic materials to these different kinds of insults over all of these length scales from the angstrom scale all the way up to the millimeter scale. So we can fully characterize these materials in silico computationally and then experimentally over the, the entire range of length scale, which is a really unique capability we've got here at Purdue. Uh, and here's an example of some simulations in this particular case. These are loads applied to, this is HMX as an energetic material held together by a rubbery binder. Uh, and we're simulating a, a load being applied from the left-hand side and how stress propagates through this material, which will ultimately lead to heat at these regions, uh, which will lead to a detonation. And in this particular case, you can, you can see this is a molecular dynamics simulation of a void which is a, uh, a discontinuity between the rubbery energetic material and a crystal or a particle of HMX. And you can see that there is a void right here. And then you can see our ability to predict how that void collapses, both in a finite element model environment and with a molecular dynamics environment uh, when a load is applied. Uh, we synthesize new energetic materials, um, and here's a good example of one of the most energetic molecules ever synthesized, which was made by uh, one of our uh, PERC faculty in materials engineering. Um, and you can see the game for making a, a molecule particularly energetic is rings, uh, nitrogen insertion, uh, and rings coupled to rings uh, are really ideally what you want to do, like in this particular case, nitrogen bearing rings to nitrogen bearing rings. Um, here's an example of how we test the, ener the energetic properties of a, a new molecule. This is a stainless steel plate, and you look at the ability to, to create this kind of a hole in the stainless steel plate uh, using milligram or smaller quantities of energetic material. And you can see some large crystals of energetic material that were grown in our labs. Here's an example of the hypergols. Uh, you can see um, where this is in uh, milliseconds. Uh, yeah, here's a droplet of our hypergolic material. After two milliseconds, you start to see ignition and then you see rapid release of energy and you see this green glow here. These are amine borings um, and these are propellants that are used in rockets. Um, and you can see, uh, ideally you want this, this time from contact to ignition to be as short as possible. And you can see that this is just uh, a millisecond. Um, and so this is very good performing um, hypergol that we've created in this particular case. And it's a really cool picture. Uh, for our additive manufacturing work, this is some, some um, ink, energetic ink that was printed to, to um, connect this circuit. And with, when uh, electrical current is applied, this can um, uh, burn or, or deflagrate and destroy, or depending on what's in this ink, uh, detonate and destroy uh, the material above and below it. And so we can use this um, for very, very precise detonations or very, very precise applications of energy. Um, we also can print material that looks like modeling clay, like this material right here. And here's an example of that. Uh, and I always am disappointed when we print the Purdue logo and we could print some other university's logo. But this is a mixture of aluminum and a Teflon material, 
uh, which is representative of a uh, propellant. Okay. Now here's an example of uh, fuel that we've print that we've created. This is alloyed fuel. On the left, this is just aluminum burning. And on the right, this is a mixture of aluminum with Teflon. And you can see the energy is coming off much more quickly. We're kicking material off the surface much more rapidly. The particle sizes coming off the surface are smaller on the right-hand side, which means we're burning the fuel much more effectively over here on the right-hand side. Uh, and so by adding in Teflon, which you wouldn't think would help at all uh, with uh, the energetic properties of the fuel, you actually create a fuel that generates more power and generates that power more quickly and utilizes the fuel more effectively than in the absence of Teflon of all materials. So this is some of the kind of work we can do to create uh, next generation um, propellants. And just give me a second for, there we go. Now here's, some, here's an example of how we can use acoustics to cause uh, energetic materials to, um, in this case, detonate or deflagrate. So on the right hand side, this is ammonium perchlorate, which is a, a common energetic material. It's encased in silgard, which is a rubbery polymer like what you see um, around a shower so the shower doesn't leak. And this is 10 watts of power. This is more or less your cell phone um, speaker. Uh, and you can see that we can drive in a very short period of time uh, to uh, a detonation inside this um, energetic composite. On the left-hand side, this is uh, the same uh, speaker. This is a different energetic material. Uh, in this case, this is HMX. And we're applying the energy uh, much less effectively on this side. So we're able to cause a temperature change, but not go all the way uh, to a breakdown of the material. So this gives us the ability to control the response of the energetic material by tuning the way that we put energy into the energetic material, which has implications for how we can use them in theater. So here's an example of how uh, we can use lasers. Uh, here's a, a flame and we, we piggyback two laser signals um, through the flame and in you get a signal that has a certain wavelength distribution. And then coming through, you see a change in that distribution. And so by looking at uh, the particularly the, the IR signal, you can get a feel for what chemical species are inside that flame. So in this case, we're going to cause a detonation and we're going to send a laser through that detonation to look at the species that are formed and the temperature change. So here's the detonation. It slowed way down. Okay. And now we're going to, that laser was going through that detonation and we're able to learn. In, in this particular case, this is HMX, which was what we were studying on the, in the bottom. And then HMX mixed with uh, a micro particulate aluminum metal. Uh, HMX is, is a... Um, um, a, a common uh, energetic uh, material, common explosive. And you can see that we can track temperature change all the way up to almost, uh, almost 3000 degrees uh, over milliseconds during that detonation. And then we can track uh, the, the um, relaxation of the, of the temperature profile uh, after, the, the fireball, after the fireball initiated here at about 1,500 degrees. Hey, Steve, there's a, there's a good question uh, about slide 10. Can you jump back to that? I can. Thank you, Steve. I have lost the chat, so I appreciate it. One more. Uh, slide 10. Yep, I'm trying to get there. There it is. There we okay. go. Okay, and then I guess the question was, um, can you explain the diagram on the left? I'll, I'll go ahead and explain that because that's my diagram. That's your work. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, Professor so, Sun. So on the top, uh, that shows uh, a luminized propellant. So this is... Ammonium perchlorate, HTPB, which is a binder holding everything together, and aluminum. And in the top of the diagram, it says neat aluminum. So that's just aluminum particles, and that's typically what you see in a, in a solid propellant. So the particles will kind of stick together as, they, as the burning surface overcomes them. They'll, they'll stick, and then they'll center together, forming a large burning droplet. Uh, with the, what's labeled MA. ALPTFE, that's mechanically activated aluminum Teflon. Uh, we've modified the particles so that it's still micron aluminum mostly, but it has inclusions of Teflon inside the particle. And instead of sticking together and agglomerate forming these big burning droplets, they break apart and, and actually can even micro explode. And on the very bottom image is a sequence of, uh, 
of, of particles that, that break apart. And then the videos show um, the results of that, of looking at a, a propellant strand uh, burning. So thanks for the question. There was another question from uh, Patrick, which I think was answered about whether or not the, uh, the aluminum here on the left was being uh, consumed in a pure oxygen environment. And uh, Professor McLean answered, uh, as well as Professor Sun, uh, indicating that we don't require outside oxygen in this particular case. Um, and um, uh, Professor McLean indicated that the um, was talking about the perk, which I believe was over on this particular discussion. Now, she was saying that the ammonium perchlorate, which is an oxidizer, is, is providing the oxygen in the propellant. Okay, very good. And All right, are there other questions? I should introduce my faculty colleagues who are on. So Professor Sun in mechanical engineering is on with us today. This is his work. Uh, Professor McLean uh, does some work that's in the um, additive manufacturing. Um, is Professor Rhodes on also? Yes, he is. Okay, he must be on mute right now. Are there any other of my PERC colleagues who are on the call? I can't see everybody. Um, I, think, I think that's it. Jeff, did you want to introduce yourself? Hi everyone, I'm Jeff Rhodes. I'm the director of Herrick Labs and uh, faculty members inside of PERC as well. So thanks for making the time this afternoon. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. So please continue to, to jump in with questions. And if I can't answer them, I'll toss them to the team. The modified material with Teflon is able to change the properties of the material when sintering will not pull into such large agglomerates, instead stay as smaller agglomerates. Yes, that's, that's essentially what's happening. Uh, material state that doesn't agglomerate, um, it's burning at a lower temperature and it's not kicked off in larger agglomerates either. Yeah, that's about right. And, and, and why that's important, Tyler, is uh, the large burning agglomerates will become large alumina products. And as they clunk out your nozzle, you'll get two phase flow losses, which hurts your performance. And that's about five or 10% loss in performance. So it can be important. Okay, so I had uh, shown you uh, the uh, post detonation fireball, the temperature profile. And then here's some examples of us using that same sort of IR diagnostics. Um, in, in this particular case, this is HMX, again, uh, common explosive, secondary explosive. Um, and this is uh, Professor Goldenstein's, Goldenstein's work, excuse me. Um, and you can see in this particular case, uh, looking at temperature profiles in the flame as the flame is evolving. Um, and on the right-hand side, you can see not only a temperature profile, but also um, some compositional information that Chris can, uh, can pull uh, from these kinds of analyses. Um, and so this gives us the ability to look in these uh, post detonation fireballs or in uh, um, the output from a, um, from a rocket, uh, the way that some propellant is burning and get some information about chemically what's happening and mechanically what's happening and therefore how effectively are we burning the fuel? What are the performance conditions of this energetic material? Okay, now in this particular case, this, this image right here, this is a, a detonator. We're imaging this at uh, 10 megahertz. And this is high speed, ultra high speed diagnostics. Um, and this is um, Professor Meyer's work. Uh, and in this particular case, what we're interested in doing is seeing where the solid material goes following a detonation. So we're looking at multi-phase blast fields. Um, and so here's an example of material, X-ray imaging material coming out of a spray can. Uh, where are all of the particles going in 3D in space? And you can see these images right down here where it can rotate them. So we have the ability to know exactly where the solid material is in, as it flies, as it, as it moves through space following a detonation. And one of the interesting applications, there are two of them right down here at the bottom corner. I mentioned at the very beginning, if we're trying to destroy chemical agents, we can't just spray particulate chemical material into the environment when there's a detonation. We have to the, the, we have to consume that material before it can escape uh, a detonation zone. The same would be the case if we're trying to destroy a bioagent. Um, we have to know where the solid material will go uh, in the detonation. What will the temperature profile be? And that work that I just showed you combined with this work lets us engineer that fireball to destroy what needs to be destroyed, but not harm anything else. And here's some other examples of what we can do with a really high speed 3D imaging 
Um, and what you can see here, this is uh, compositional information that we can pull out uh, OH, these are hydroxides. Uh, and you can see the color maps showing where there's more or less material. On the right-hand side, you can see temperature maps. Uh, and this is soot coming off of a combustion system through a flame. Um, and on the right-hand side here, we can track the fluorescence to track nitro uh, NO formation. Um, again, um, in, a, in a burning environment. Right? So this gives us some added flexibility and capability of evaluating what happens in a post-detonation fireball. So this is a case where we take an energetic material. I'm gonna focus down here on the right-hand side. This is an HMX crystal in a rubbery polymer. And we uh, take it to the uh, electron beam at, uh, or the X-ray beam, excuse me, at Argonne National Labs. And we watch what happens when it gets hit by a high-speed projectile, which is gonna come in from the left-hand side. And then you can see that it gets crushed. Something that looks liquidy happens at the interface, but we're not exactly sure what that is. Now it's gonna rapidly expand and boom, disintegrate. Okay, so this looks like what happens when a, uh, energetic material in, in a, um, a ballistic environment strikes some surface. You see it's rapidly compressed and you want to understand what's going to happen to the energetic material in that environment. How does it initiate? How does it decom decompose? What happens in the binder material? And so we can look at that with unprecedented uh, precision to try to understand what happens in this composite material under these very, very high rate impacts. Um, Okay, so there's a very detailed discussion of aluminum lithium uh, fuels, which I'm going to skip uh, right now because it probably will go over the head of a bunch of folks, uh, but it's in the chat and it's interesting. Um, so let's keep going here. Uh, we're just about to the point where we can have a little bit more general discussion. Um, I mentioned what we can do computationally. So something that's very important for, for our national defense is the ability to create our modern arsenal and do it in a sustainable way. You can't just continue to print money. Um, so we have to be able to manufacture the energetic materials that we need, manufacture the arsenal that we need in a cost-effective way and recover materials at the end of the day if we don't end up using them um, in a conflict. Okay, And so we have a digital enterprise center that works at the entire uh, process from uh, acquiring raw materials all the way through to producing a final product. And this uh, looks at that entire process in a holistic way, uh, including things like, you know, what do the customers think? The customers in this particular case are soldiers um, or airmen. Um, we have concerns about how do we do our manufacturing? How do we monitor what we're manufacturing? Um, how is it used in the field? How do people interact with the manufacturing process? Um, how do we keep the process safe from prying eyes? And there are plenty of prying eyes for this kind of work. And so it's a complicated, comprehensive computational environment to evaluate the entire manufacturing network for these kinds of materials, which are critical uh, to our national security. So hopefully I gave you a feel for the range of opportunities that we've got. Um, we, we work on the entire spectrum of energetic materials from developing a brand new molecule, almost to the point of implementing that in a munition. We are the foremost uh, university center really in the world, certainly in the Western hemisphere in this space. If you want to come and do some research with us, uh, it will lead to careers in our national labs, our Department of Energy National Labs, and our Department of Defense Labs, uh, Army Research Lab, Navy Research Lab, Air Force Labs. Um, there's also quite a bit of extension of this kind of work into companies um, that like Blue Origin that are involved with propulsion for rockets that are going for space travel. There's applications of this kind of work for things like Kevlar vests to protect people um, uh, when, they're, when they're going to experience a high uh, impact. Um, there's applications of this in the pharmaceutical manufacturing industry because manufacturing energetic materials is extremely similar to manufacturing pharmaceuticals. So the training that you'll get here uh, is comprehensive. Um, it will lead to some very exciting careers and there's an enormous need, an enormous need, I cannot overstate it, for people who are trained and skilled in working with these kinds of materials. And I hope you got you excited about them and I'm delighted to take any questions that you've got as, my, as are my colleagues who are with me here uh, on, the, on the Zoom call. 
uh, about energetic materials. So I'm going to be quiet and follow the chat and hope to hear from you with, with questions that are of interest. Thank you very much for taking some time with us today. Can I allow people to just go ahead and unmute themselves and speak if you just want to ask a question rather than typing? I'm perfectly fine with that. I'd rather have a conversation than... Uh, you can also raise your hand if you want to be... Sure, that's perfectly fine with me. I've got the participant list up right now so I can track these things. Okay, Ashley is advertising what's next. It's not time for next yet, Ashley. We've still got 15 minutes of energetic materials discussion, but thank you. Hi, Professor, I have a question. Okay. So you talked a little bit earlier before about the um, inkjet printing and you know some of the applications of that. Could you give a couple more maybe specific examples of the potential uses for that that kind of product? Sure, let me uh, let Professor Rhodes start uh, with the response to that. Um, and then I think Professor Sun and also uh, Professor McLean would also want to weigh in on that because each of them are uh, pursuing different applications in that particular space. I do a little work in that space, helping out with how the printed materials adhere and hang together and withstand. Um, the different performance conditions, but they are really focused on the applications and I think can can give some more varied and interesting answers. So Jeff, if you're there, do you want to kick off and then maybe Monique? So I think uh, the work that we do, at least in the inkjet space, uh, really originated from some work we were doing, uh, looking at ways to creatively functionalize small scale elements and to build primitive electronics and co-integrating those with energetic materials. Uh, a lot of our initial work was in things like co-printing primitive electronics, simple ignition mechanisms with say nanothermite systems, uh, high gas producing energetic materials, uh, and a variety of other things like that, largely for anti-tamper applications. In fact, the original program we were funded out of was uh, to help to cure weapons of mass destruction through anti-tamper systems. In more recent times, uh, in, over the last year or so, We've branched out to some other application spaces as well, including printing conductive polymers, uh, which have certain value in some energetic materials applications, as well as doing things like looking at the ability to integrate uh, antennas, heaters, um, other strain gauges, other simple electronic uh, uh, functionalities to energetic material systems as a way to either manipulate performance of that at the system level or to perhaps interrogate the health of, of the munition system or rocket motor or whatever it happens to be. Uh, so those are the application spaces that we've largely focused in to date. I should say that that's within uh, the context of energetic materials. We also have a fairly large and robust uh, program doing inkjet printing uh, for non-energetic applications as well. And certainly I'll put, drop my email in the chat. And if you wanna learn more about that, I know Steve just posted a link to a YouTube video, but. If you have more uh, that you'd like to see beyond that, please feel free to reach out to me and I'd be happy to answer questions. Monique, would you like to talk a little bit about uh, what you're gonna be doing here with uh, uh, additive manufacturing or printing of energetics? Are you still with us? I'm hoping so. There you are, yes. Yeah. yeah, sure. I'm happy to talk more about 3D printing energetics. So a lot of my background is in 3D printing solid propellants, uh, but you could extend that to the technique that we use to 3D print solid propellants can really print many different viscous materials. So you could print many different formulations. Um, you could print ceramic matrix composites, which could be high temperature materials. So there are a lot of opportunities there. Uh, and it's a pretty new research area trying to 3D print energetic materials. So any work that we do there would be of value to the community. So in general, I'll be focusing on uh, trying to 3D print some uh, dissimilar materials. So for example, uh, trying to 3D print um, a region where one energetic burns faster than the other, but combining them with different processes, um, trying to potentially scale up the 3D printed propellants uh, that I've done in the past, and just kind of investigating some of those fundamental 3D printing problems. 
So, Steve, I don't know if you want to add anything there, or I can hop in and add a little bit. I think I think they did a wonderful job. Uh, I would just add that you know, there's really three kind of printing um, platforms that we we've looked at. Um, all of this is in you know close collaboration with uh, Jeff Rhodes and 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 others. Um, one is the inkjet printing that was discussed. Uh, the second is uh, a fused deposition or a fused fabrication uh, method where we, we make a reactive material, a filament. If you're, you're uh, uh, familiar with the MakerBot and things like that, it's one of the most common 3D printers at home. So we, we extrude uh, reactive uh, uh, filaments and then print those into, you, you can make structural materials that are also reactive. And then the third is uh, uh, a special um, uh, viscous printing capability that uh, Monique worked a lot with uh, here as well. And um, where we can print highly loaded, high viscous materials such as propellants and explosives. So we do a lot with uh, you know, printed energetic materials. So that was a good question. Tyler, was that a satisfactory answer? Yeah, I really enjoyed all of that input. And thank you all very much, especially for um, the emails so that I can possibly follow up with you. I appreciate it. Okay. Yes, we've all dumped our emails into the chat. I hope anybody who's, who's uh, participating today will feel free to follow up with us. Um, we'd love to get some, some more uh, graduate students. Um, we have no shortage of opportunities right now. The, the, We've been very, very successful with, with our uh, work with our sponsors. So we're really looking forward to gearing up. Some other questions, please. Yeah, so um, I guess this is a bit more of a specific question. Um, uh, so I've got a chemical engineering background. Um, and uh, I, I guess some of the things you had mentioned uh, were like the uh, I guess potential modeling of that multi-phase flow um, that could cause losses, um, uh, potentially also um, scaling up manufacturing of their processes. Um, so I, I know that a lot of the, um, uh, I guess a, lo a lot of the coursework I've done has been um, sort of towards process scale up um, and uh, some of the research I've done has been more on the material science side and looking at like characterizations um, uh, such as like the XRD that you guys might be doing. Um, I guess, is there sort of a, uh, a role that chemical engineers at this, um, at the center uh, fit more cleanly into, or is it sort of just on a, an as, uh, I, I guess, depend dependent on where the, the needs are and um, I guess where interests lie. Um, well, sure, this is a great question. Um, so uh, the, the first answer is there are many opportunities for chemical engineers. I'm a chemical engineer by training. Um, so chemical engineers like chemistry, um, there are opportunities for us to get involved with the synthesis of new molecules, which is really, you know, the test tube type chemistry, the, the kind of chemistry that you did in your organic chemistry lab to create new molecules um, and then to characterize them um, using different techniques to figure out, did we make what we thought we made? Um, what kinds of impurities are there? What crystal structure did we get? All of those kinds of analyses are analyses chemical engineers are comfortable with. We're also involved now with uh, reaction engineering and reactor engineering because making these materials in a modern, efficient, cost-effective way is, is increasingly important. And so in the same way that many of your peers are going to go out and do reactor engineering and reaction engineering to make a new polymer, to make a carpet resist uh, wear, uh, we're going to be doing reactor and reaction engineering to make an energetic material more safely, more cost-effectively. Um, we also get involved with crystallization, which is key uh, most people who are doing crystallization work right now are doing it for the pharma industry or the food industry, but all of the same issues apply for the energetic materials. That's how we recover energetic materials that we're going to use. And so chemical engineering is all about the phase transformations, um, how we control the composition, how we control the environment, what kinds of crystal structures we form, what kinds of crystal sizes we form. Um, and then all of the formulation steps, how do we blend those crystals in with binder material um, and ultimately have a continuous manufacturing process or a semi-batch manufacturing process and have that full manufacturing line come together to be able to produce material in a consistent way. So if you're interested in the process systems engineering area, uh, the process control area, um, those kinds of applications 
are really important in excellent applications of the chemical engineering background you've got. My own little small area where I'm involved in here, uh, involving the adhesion of the energetic materials is certainly one where chemical engineers uh, can have a role, uh, but it's only a small piece of really just about anything you would do with your chem e degree if you went out to work for a DuPont, you would be doing in the energetic materials space. Um, does that uh, help answer your question? I think your name is Brendan. I was able to catch you in the, the yes. Did that answer your yeah. question, Brendan? Yeah, definitely. I, uh, I really appreciate the, the detailed response that, um, that definitely helps a lot. Okay. The one part I didn't mention is the, the, the computational work is also very strong for us. Uh, molecular dynamics kinds of work, um, machine learning, uh, AI kinds of uh, computation is an important part of what we do here in the center. And chemical engineers have a good background for that kind of thing. Perfect. So good question. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time. I'm just checking my phone. Yeah, we have about four minutes. Okay, we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. I'll try to talk very fast uh, for if we get more than a couple questions. Are there any more, please? While we're waiting for questions, I'll just add to that that um, I, I have a chemical engineer, an engineer in my group, um, both in in chemical engineering that uh, Steve Bowden and I co-advise, and I have a, a bachelor's level chemical engineer that switched to mechanical engineering. So uh, that's that's all an option. So there's there's several departments that that we span across in all areas. Uh, energetic materials is is incredibly multidisciplinary. Yeah, it's, it's not at all unusual for you to have uh, advisors from different academic units so that you can have the full, um, uh, the guidance that you're going to need in order to fully evaluate and, and fully understand uh, important scientific problems. It's not housed only in one unit. So some other questions, we might have time for just one more. I really hope so. Okay, it seems like the, the answer to that might be no, um, and that's okay. Uh, so I, I'll just go ahead and remind you that uh, Professor Rhodes, Professor Sun, Professor McLean, and myself have all put our emails into the chat. Um, we'll leave that open for a few minutes so that you can copy those down. Certainly, if anything that I described today was of interest, please drop me. Uh, my email is sbodoi, S-B-E-A-U-D-O-I, at purdue.edu. And it doesn't have to be about my own research. Um, as center director, my job is to connect you with the people who do the work that excites you. And I would be very happy uh, to, to form those connections and make sure that you get uh, the conversations that you want with our faculty in all of those different disciplines. Um, and again, I'll mention chemistry, materials engineering, mechanical engineering, chemical engineering. I, I forgot to mention aero. I apologize to my aero astro colleagues. Uh, and also in the polytechnic, um, and in environmental engineering. So there's applications across a broad spectrum of disciplines um, where we really um, have some exciting work going on. So that said, thank you very much for taking some time. I hope you're enjoying the expo. Um, and I look forward to hearing from you uh, via email. Please just put a Big Ten Expo in the, in the subject line of an email that you send me so that I know to respond to you very quickly. And uh, enjoy the rest of your sessions. Take care, thank you. <laughs>